Hello and welcome to this week's Catamania episode where I chatted with Esther Sarfati, who you probably would have seen online, especially if you follow me. I feel like the algorithm would have definitely pushed Esther's videos into your feed, considering that she talks about stuff that I talk about often, but in a completely different way. Esther is a psychologist and she talks a lot in her social media work about relationships, how to effectively communicate with men, especially, you know, in the beginning stages of a relationship and also in long-term relationships and how to naturally become more feminine. You will find all of these subjects discussed in this episode. I tried to ask Esther as many questions as I could in this regard. She's definitely a wealth of knowledge and wisdom when it comes to this. And what I love the most about it is how simple she believes everything is. You know, I think we complicate, I do that too, we complicate all of these questions a lot like how to you know, communicate effectively with your partner, especially if you're in a long-term relationship, how to make sure that you ask the right questions, how to make sure that you talk in a way that is loving and you don't get too comfortable. You know what it means to get too comfortable when you kind of just treat your partner as, you know, not not as good as you should be treating your partner probably, which happens to a lot of people in uh, long-term relationships. So without giving it too much away, I know you will enjoy this one. And uh, of course, if you do in the end, please give it five stars, thumbs up, hearts, whatever the like button is on the platform that you're listening to this on. It means way more than you know. And stay blessed. Welcome, Esther. Thank you so much. Nice to be here. Yes, thank you for coming on to my show. I'm very excited to chat with you. We kind of got into a little bit of, uh, you know, how you came to the idea of starting a social media career, so to speak. But do you mind just kind of starting off with, I hate asking this question because it sounds like a job interview, but telling a little bit about yourself and how did you get to where you are today? Oh my God, that that takes a long time because you know I've done a lot. <laughs> Look, I I think from a very young age on, I was always very interested in helping people. I really like that. You know, I just think that some people have a calling or something. So I felt it from a very young age. I really wanted to study psychology or otherwise become an actress. <laughs> Those were my two options. So I started with the acting in the beginning and the modeling and all that stuff. But later on, I thought, no, I really want to study psychology. So I studied, I started my studies when I was 25, a little bit later. I loved it from day one. As soon as I opened the books, I knew this is my thing. This really fits me. And it's actually a very selfish occupation to work in this field because me through helping others i get so much you know joy and i feel so you know useful and grateful that you know i couldn't wish for a better life choice and to start with the internet that is a very much later because i did a lot of other things on the internet because i like to do many different things i did a cook show in the past on Greek television because I live in Greece most of the year. I wrote a cookbook um, and then I did my modeling. I worked a little bit as an actress. And then after I finished the cook show stuff on TV, um, I thought that I wanted to do something with more depth. So psychology for me to use it on a daily basis to help people is exactly what fits me. And it never tires me. And yeah, I love my job. And the internet really scared me in the beginning because when you expose yourself on the internet, you know, you you expose yourself worldwide and there's a lot of crazy people out there. And it's also a bit dangerous to say your opinion on the internet because nothing in life is black and white, according to my opinion. And I don't like to call myself like an expert because nobody is an expert. I'm also learning every day. I'm reading, I'm learning from others. You always have to fuel yourself, I think, with information. You're never done, you know? So overall, it's kind of a lifestyle now, you know? It's not just a job. Uh, It's the way I live. So that's uh, how my life has evolved. In a nutshell. (laughs) Right. 
And a little bit, just my own curiosity, what, what made you choose Greece for part of, because you're, you said in the beginning, you're from Holland. Is that correct? Yes. I'm half yes. Dutch, half German. I was born and raised in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And I knew also from a very young age that I wanted to leave my country because I wanted to explore the world. I love traveling because I love to meet new people, new cultures, because that's very educative and you just learn a lot from that. So I first moved to Spain as soon as I graduated from high school because I wanted to stall going to university for just a few years. And then I moved back to the Netherlands and I came to Greece on like a vacation. Uh, I'd been to Greece before on holidays and I loved it. I always loved the Mediterranean lifestyle because people here, they are more traditional still, you know, more old school families are tighter together. They really have long meals together. The climate is very attractive. Greece is a beautiful country anyway. So that's kind of like how I first fell in love with Greece. And then I fell in love with a Greek. So <laughs> that was how oh. I came here, you know, love takes you around the world. <laughs> I love that. I love stories like that. You know, you kind of fall in love with a place and then fall in love with somebody from that place, or you fall in love with somebody from a certain place and then you end up falling in love with a place, right? That's the best, the best thing. You mentioned that you kind of divide your time between, I guess, Western Europe and I mean, Greece is not really Eastern Europe, but I guess more on the Eastern side of, of, of things. And you mentioned the more traditional approach um, to, I guess, family values in Greece. Do you find, was it scary for you? Because you obviously talk in your content online, your approach to that is more traditional. Was that scary for you to kind of start speaking about those values in a world where those values are kind of, have seemed to be fading even though I know there's more of a comeback in that regard. Yeah, I, I have had comments like, oh, girl, we're not back in the 1950s. But actually, I am not very often very fanatic about certain points of view or certain concepts. But about that, I'm super fanatic. First of all, most of the stuff I talk about is about things that I personally have done wrong. So I would like to help younger women to prevent making the same mistakes. Because when you're younger, you just look at life differently and you look at love differently and about falling in love. Your needs are different. So you don't get it yet, right? You don't have this full picture. And I have it now. I have enough experience. So I would just like to pass on that life cannot be lived when we are competing with each other. And that's what I see nowadays. Couples compete. Because women live in a man's world. Women have become very aggressive. Women almost have like a narcissistic attitude towards men. Um, because women have the power right now, right? And that is great. It's beautiful. But I think we've, we got it a bit wrong. I think all this freedom that we have right now is amazing. But we misuse it. And that's, at the end, not good for us women. It doesn't have so much to do with men in a selfish way. I want to help women to think and act in a more traditional way towards relationships because at the end it helps us women. Yeah. I have realized recently, well, fairly recently, that in this chase of equality between men and women, we have kind of, if you really think about it, started to benefit men more than ourselves in certain aspects you know we don't really ask men to take that much responsibility anymore we don't ask them for commitment anymore we don't seek that commitment as much and there's just certain things that i think are more detrimental towards us women in this i don't even think it's a pursuit of equality anymore because i think we got that equality of opportunity that originally was something that feminists in like you know the 50s and the 60s were striving for and then we went like way over over that now it's just confusion it seems to me what would you say then so let's you know to kind of not to quite close the subject but would you say that a lot of women who are sort of in their masculine in your experience and in your view are still wanting a very strong provider 
uh, by their side. So they're not maybe inherently masculine. They're sort of, they've been conditioned to be that way and they still want a masculine guy. Yeah, I think by nature, most women want a masculine guy. We want a man to make us feel safe, even though we are mm-hmm. working, we're independent, we're, raised, we're doing having everything alone, right? We don't need to prove that anymore. Okay, maybe we can't build roads and buildings and like, you know, hardcore stuff that men are way better at. And I totally respect, you know, because they're also built much stronger than we are by nature. But I do believe that even the women who have become so masculine, it's like you said, they're kind of conditioned like that. You know, I grew up in the Netherlands, right? When you in the Netherlands, then and now, are a woman who's 25 years old and you finished your studies, let's say, or you finished any kind of course you wanted to do, you didn't, you don't have to go to university, obviously, and you're not working. That's like odd. That's like, what? What's wrong with you? You know, you need to prove yourself. So we have pushed ourselves to become like men. You know, you're weird if you sit at home and you raise kids. Why would you do that? Are you crazy? You're making yourself vulnerable. You know, you're making yourself dependent on that man. And what if he leaves you? So all that is extremely negative in my eyes and very confusing because nobody knows their role anymore. There's also no book or guideline like what should we do how should we date and most of my clients are actually women who are stuck in exactly that concept you know we're out there working esther how are we supposed to be these females who are you know leaned in into our feminine energy and soft and sweet and magnetic and all that crap we have no time for that how are we supposed to be that and attract this man that we actually want so it's a real issue but i do believe there are solutions Uh, which is a very big subject, but I am very hopeful that you can get there. You can get this done in life. You can be this beautiful couple who this woman is both independent, doing her her thing, but also very much connected to her feminine. That was something that you just jumped right into that. that, That's like the main (laughs) question. How do you do that? How do you you know, have this independence, you maybe run your own business, you do your own thing and you have this because a lot of women that I know, they're very feminine and they want to be in their feminine. And maybe they don't really feel like they're 100% meant for the stay at home mom, very tough job, by the way, I've always said that it's one of the toughest jobs that exists, if not the toughest um, in the world period. But what if they really do feel like, okay, I'm really good at being a mom and I love being a mom and I'm very traditional, but I I still want my own thing and I still want to have that independence of mine, so to speak. How do you maintain then your femininity and you be a good wife, you be a good mom and you be in your soft lifestyle and you strive and achieve more? In my eyes, it's pretty simple. It's even simple to execute it. It's not just simple as a theory. It's simple also as a lifestyle. I believe that everything in life literally has to do with how you manage things, how you manage yourself, first of all, because to be able to be in your feminine, you have to show respect towards yourself, right? You have to know who you are and what your values are. And that's already problem number one. Because the way women are raised nowadays, they have no clue who they are and what they want. They just go by the internet, what they hear everybody say, and it gets even more confusing. Uh, There's so much information out there that sometimes too much information actually uh, confuses people, right? So that's why I strip it down and I say, let's take this very simple. It's how you manage yourself. You need self-respect. You need to understand what your values are. You need to understand that in life, you cannot go forward, neither by being aggressive, nor by being the sweet traditional person. You have to learn how to manage your time. Your time is very valuable. We don't realize that, you know, young people think, oh, we're young, we have time. Yes and no, you don't have time. If you wanna manage your life well, start as young as possible because you will make mistakes and you will maybe enter the wrong relationship which finally wasn't this masculine guy that you thought he was because he looked masculine and he talked masculine and you tried to be in your feminine, but somehow you didn't set your boundaries right from the beginning. So the beginning 
is very important. You cannot easily change your life after 45 and then, you know, understand what your values are. You have to ask these questions to yourself at a young age. So I hope that, for example, in the future school system, there will actually be lessons that help young women and young men to understand who they are, what they are, what they want, what they want to offer in this life and where they want to get in this life. So to be in your feminine, to make it a bit shorter your, um, to your question, because I'm going off in all kinds of directions, you have to manage your life. Like, for example, when you go to work at six in the morning, just to give a stupid example, what you do is you put your clothes and everything you need for your makeup and your hair out the night before. What I do, I go in the kitchen, I put my coffee, I put everything there, my vitamins, my supplements, my gym clothes, I have everything ready. So I make it easy for myself. You have to find things to help yourself. You cannot be, yes, but I can't, yes, but. That's aggressive energy. That's being in your masculine. So if you want to be in your feminine, you have to be kind to yourself first of all, right? That is already being in your feminine. And you can practice this. You can practice this on a daily basis. Let's say you don't have much time. You're super pressured by work and kids and a husband who's needy and you need to cook and do all that stuff. You need to take every day like for half an, half an hour or one hour to be busy just with you and to, be some, to do something nice for you. Don't wake up and go at six o'clock in the morning and run five miles like a crazy person. That just puts your body into fight flight mode. Do something nice that softens you from within for yourself. Because when you do that for yourself and you learn how to treat yourself in a nice way and how to manage your own life so that you actually help yourself, like putting out your clothes the night before, those are simple like examples. Um, then you will be able to manage the rest of your life as well in that setting, you know, and tune into your feminine energy. And I like this term feminine energy, masculine energy, but that's like a very, you know, on the internet, that's like in fashion right now. We all talk about these energies. Yes, definitely. And I like it and I don't. Sometimes my hair, you know, go, right, goes up when I hear it because it's all, it sounds very mysterious. What is this? Being in my feminine, how do I do that? You know, so that's why I like to call it how to manage your life in a way that actually suits you and is good for you. And the other thing I would like to add is that we have a big problem nowadays, we women, because we're so conflicted, right? We have to be masculine. But then at home, how can we be feminine, all that stuff? So what we, in the course of this, you know, becoming more free and doing whatever we want to do and not thinking anything of it, we've also kind of created this illusion that because we are so powerful now, we can mold this man into what suits us. So in the course of that, we don't accept men anymore. And that is another big issue. I see this every, every day. We don't accept him for what he can give us. So you either decide this is a man who's in his masculine energy, let's say, or whatever. He has those good things. And he also has things I don't like. But you know what? The good things weigh out the bad things. So I'll accept him. And I won't nag about the things he doesn't do. These are huge issues we should overcome because at the end of the day, as a woman, it makes you happier when you decide that you can accept your man for who he is. Hmm. It's a selfish thing again, you see? Well, is it a selfish thing though? Because isn't, isn't it more selfish in a way to leave, you know, whenever something is upsetting or whenever something isn't serving you? to just focus on the bad and be like, okay, you know what? I'm not going to make it work. Because in a way, when you accept him for what he can give you and for who he is, you're kind of, well, you're, you're accepting him, right? You're accepting, you're taking the, I guess, it's always easy to leave is what I'm trying to say, right? Well, not that it's easy, but, you know, to leave a relationship and break it all up is kind of the easy way. But to work on it and be like, no, you know what? I'm accepting you for who you are. But let's work on our relationship. I'm going to work on myself to be able to actually legitimately accept you for who you are. And we're going to make this thing work. So I, I don't know if it's selfish. I feel like maybe it's a, it's a, 
it's a, it's a good thing. But I know what you mean. I know where you're coming from when you say that. You mentioned uh, feminine energy and masculine energy and how that's almost like a fashionable trend. Try divine feminine. Yeah. That's the thing that is like also all over social media, right? Divine feminine, femininity. What about, so you were talking about accepting. In what case do you think, do you, or how do you know if, if he's the right guy? You know, how do you know if you should accept him? You said when the good stuff outweighs the bad. But, you know, if somebody's listening to this and they're unsure of their partner, like let's say there's, you know, 15 good things, but there's one really major thing that's really bothering her and she can't let go of it. How does she know what outweighs what? What okay. questions should she be this asking is also, herself? This is also very simple. The truth is that when you meet a guy... I like that you say that it's simple because to me, there's such hard simple. questions, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's simple because, you know, we women have this issue that we overanalyze everything and that works against us, right? If we would think more like men do, like more in a logical way, we put everything in a little box and give it, you know, a place, then we would be much happier. We overanalyze. So he did this, he said that, but then if he would say this, what would we do? And maybe that one thing he does that I really don't like, maybe that would become an issue later on. So it's like, you know, we're making everything so difficult for us. So you meet a guy, you fall in love with him. The truth is you don't really know if he's the one, because when you're 20, your needs and your desires are completely different from when you're 40. Uh, because people change, people evolve. It's not just your life with him. When you choose a partner, you also choose his past, his family, his friends, his environment. Maybe you change country because you, you know, you choose to, lo to love him like I did, for example. So you'd never really know. You have to, as a woman, I think go mostly by your gut feeling. And you also have to be realistic. So when you decide at some point that this is him because you leave it for a certain time to marinate, let's say, to see how this relationship evolves. That's why I think you should never jump too fast into a relationship. I think women should really restrict. I love this word. I use this word with all my clients and with myself. You should really restrict your energy as a woman. You should always do that, even if you've been married for 30 years. Because you should always want a man to keep pursuing you. And once you just give everything and he knows everything about you and there is no more mystery and you've walked around, you know, with no makeup forever and like looking slouchy and he's seen all sides of you, which I'm not saying you should never do, but it shouldn't be a regular thing in my world. Um, you're right about that. Then, I agree. I always say like, just yeah. put in an effort, even when you're at home to look good. Yeah. Especially when you're at home, because he's your person, the people mm -hmm. out there, who cares? They're not your people. You know, we dress up, we put on such expensive clothes and we go out, this is a, you know, side note to clubs and they're like a hundred people. We don't know who cares. And at home, we like let everything hang. And then my clients tell me, yeah, but I'm exhausted. Yeah, I understand that, but he's your person. Don't you want him also to make an effort for you? But to make an effort for each other, one has to start making the effort, right? Because then the other will copy it. He will mirror you. So anyway, to get back to the subject, when you decide that he's the one, uh, you have to be realistic. You have to know yourself and you have to restrict with giving your energy. You don't give him everything from the beginning. So you give this relationship like six months to a year before I think it really sinks in. Like, okay, this is my person, I think. You're never 100% sure. Even when you say your vows in the church or wherever you say your vows, you're never 100% sure. But you should go by your gut feeling. And I think the most important thing which I really try to, let's say, teach is it's all about the decision because in life, everything we do is a decision, right? I get up this morning and I decide that this will be a good day. Even if things don't go my way, I decide. And that's how I feel about my man. I decide that he is my man. So that means that I'll accept him for who he is because 
the more you are able to accept your person, the happier you will be in your relationship. Otherwise, you're just always trying to, you know, pick all these things he doesn't do. And how am I going to change that? And you cannot change a man. That's 100% certain. Nobody can change a man. Do you find, you know, through your work that women often become more controlling the deeper they get into a relationship? And why does that happen? Because this whole changing of a man thing is definitely very real. And and how do you control yourself from trying to change him? You make a decision to yeah. change yourself? I would also like your opinion on that. I think that that happens all the time. And this has to do with the following. You know, men are raised, they're being taught how they should treat a woman, right? They know they should open the door, buy her flowers, take her out for date nights. Like they know kind of the basics on how to do the right thing. They know they have to provide, they know they have to be a responsible parent once they're kids. Men are very aware of the concept of loss because if a man doesn't go out and work, then he has nothing, then he's a loser. If a woman doesn't go out and work, it's okay, you know, we accept it. It's okay if she, you know, does her nails and whatever is an influencer or something like that. So not in everybody's world, but in general for women, we are way more acceptable than for men, right? So a man knows that he needs to treat his woman right to make her happy. So if he's in a serious relationship, that is what he will do. That's his mission. I need to do this to make her happy. And when she's happy, he's happy. He's off the hook. He has peace of mind, right? But we as women, we get used to this. So we get used to that he always gets up at 6.30 in the morning, takes the dog out, get the mail, drives me to work so I don't get tired or whatever. and. At some point you get so used to it that then you, it's not enough anymore. You want more and more and more. So for example, he does one date night per week and he takes you to, I don't know, a pizza place. You'll be like, yeah, I don't like pizza anymore. You know, I want to eat sushi. What is this? So he feels that he doesn't do it right. And that is like the worst feeling for a man to feel that he's making a mistake, that he's not doing something right. So what we should do as women, we should compliment our men more. We forget to compliment them because we think that it all goes automatic, that he goes to work, that he does all these things for us because he himself will not ask for any help. Men don't ask for help unless he's very much in his feminine energy. Men don't ask for help because this is not how they're raised. We women ask for help. You know, we ask him, can you hang this lamp? Can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? And he tries to deliver. And if he doesn't deliver, he hears it immediately. You know, mm -hmm. we have no patience. So I think that it's sad that we women, again, don't accept him for who he is. You know, men are not, a man is not going to be good at everything in a relationship. You know, you have to choose what's more important for you. If you want a man who does everything for you because you want to be the highlight in the relationship. You want to be the center of attention. Then you have to be very aware of your choice of men, right? You shouldn't choose a man then who likes to be lazy and watch football all day. That doesn't suit you, obviously. So that's also an issue, you know? We don't choose the right men who are right for us because we don't know ourselves. We don't realize like, hey, I want to be in the center of attention. So I should choose a man who wants to be a little bit more in the background. Hmm. And then we start what mothering about... him. <laughs> yeah. And mothering is I've had someone on my podcast before, um, actually, a couple of people now, a woman and a man, and both of them were talking about the terrible idea that it is to mother a man. And how hard it is once you get into that, how hard it is to get out of it because they get used to, and this is something that I'm curious to hear your opinion as well. Men get very used to being mothered because it's sort of like a convenient position to be in. And then women get used to mothering them. So they feel like if they stop, they lose control and things will not get done. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a hard cycle to break. I don't think it's so hard to break. I just think again, that it's, it's in the hands of the woman to break it. 
Because the sad part is with all this mothering that so many women do and that I really try to talk a lot about with my clients is that once you go there, at some point, maybe your whole sex life will be a huge issue, you know, because he won't be attracted anymore to you. And he mm-hmm. doesn't, men don't know how to get themselves out of that. They don't even know probably that it's happening to them, that they're being mothered. I don't think they, they realize that something is wrong, but I think men are not so much in tune very often with how they feel and why they feel it and what they can do about it. I think we women understand way more where our mistakes lie. But we get so pissed off, like he didn't hang that lamp, he didn't do this, or you shouldn't drink that water because then you get a cold and then I have to take care of you because you don't know how to get, take care of yourself and it goes on and on and on. Instead of just being at peace. Would you like a glass of water? That's very different, you know? Yeah, Um, absolutely. So again, it's in our hands to stop ourselves. It's again, restrict. You know, you restrict again, just pull back your energy. That's all that this mothering thing is. And mothering has nothing to do with love. That's the sad part for me. Mothering is a very selfish thing we women do. It's a lot to do with our ego. We want to control the situation. We are either insecure, so we want to control the situation. We want to control him. We want to know that he's doing it the way I think is better because then I'm at peace, you know, or we are just cold. So I just, yeah, this whole mothering thing is a very dangerous thing. I've met couples who the husband actually talked like a kid to his wife with his little voice he would change his voice when he would ask her for something and it's almost impossible to break the cycle when it's been going on for many years so i really hope that whoever does that to their partner that the woman will realize that it's up to her and in her hands to stop it Hmm. and what about you know we talked about the getting deeper into relationships i guess more long term what about beginning of relationships? I know you talk a lot about, you know, what to ask a man on a first date and uh, how to check certain things in a non-manipulative way. And, you know, I want to go back to the whole buying flowers when you're in a long-term relationship and courting a woman, because that's a subject that I, I, I love it so much. I have a whole ebook about kind of the beginning stages, like the Eastern European ways, because it's very traditional where I come from, where I am right now. And uh, I found a lot of, especially immigrants in, you know, North America and Western Europe from this part of the world, female immigrants have struggled in relationships because a lot of men in the West, not all, but a lot of men in the West have lost that, um, I don't want to say that they've lost their ability. I think they have the ability, but they're afraid often to court a woman because they're afraid that it will seem like they are in some way undermining her power, you know? Whereas here in this part of the world, men go like crazy, especially in the beginning of relationships like flowers. They plan everything. They take the lead in everything. And that's the expectation. But, you know, that's a whole subject that we can get into at a later date or I guess later in this episode if we'll have time. But what mm-hmm. about the beginning of of, uh, of a relationship when you go on a date? What are some questions that a woman should ask a man to kind of feel it out if he is the right one, if she's assuming she's looking for a more of a traditional approach to family values. Yeah. So there are many questions, obviously, that you can ask, but, uh, I personally, my personal opinion, this is not my professional opinion. This is just my personal opinion. I don't like these dates where it sounds like an interview. So what do you do? Yeah. So, uh, do you like your work or I don't know anything like that? I mean, also it doesn't really say anything about the person, right? Because what women often do wrong is we date men and then we look at his appearance and if he ticks the boxes and he has the right job and he drives the right car, we kind of make up our minds like, okay, this is a guy I would date, but actually, you know, nothing about him because it's just an outer shell, right? So I find it always very important if you're looking for a serious relationship and you're a woman and you're in the beginning of dating, you have to find out what kind of family he comes from. You know, so ask him to tell you a story about his childhood, something that he still remembers nowadays as being an important event. So when he goes like, you know, my parents divorced when I was two and I never saw my father again. Oops, you know, that's that could be that he has a wounded masculine energy from within, you know. 
But if he, for example, says, oh, I grew up in a family with two more siblings and we always had great fun and I don't know, we went on family vacations and I remember that one time we did this adventures, I don't know what kind of vacation. That already sounds better. I think the way somebody grew up, like you just mentioned, nowadays the world is so small, right? Also where you live in the US or even in Eastern Europe, there's so many people from different countries living elsewhere from where they were brought up. So I see this also in Greece. There's so many foreigners here, including myself, that I think it's very important to understand somebody's family values or the way they were raised from these kind of questions. And also, if you want to see if this guy, his style, let's say, the way he looks at life, I would ask him something like, what is your vision on life? What are your goals in life? What would you really like to accomplish in this lifetime? Because life is long and short, right? And we have so many opportunities, but life is not just work and hobbies and the books we read. It's also the vision we have. So when you ask a person, what can, what's your vision on life? What, what are your life goals? Not this question like, what would you like to do in the next five years? Where would you like to be or something like that? That's all very, again, like an interview. But then you can really find out, you know, a lot about a person because I think men don't accept uh, expect sorry these kind of questions so and another question that i really like to ask uh, to tell women to ask on a date like ask the guy what did he think of you when he first saw you like you ask him literally at the end of the day so what did you think of me when you first saw me you know and it's very interesting the way that he will then describe you says a lot about his character. You know, it says a lot about if he's emotionally a little bit developed or if he just sits there and says, well, I thought you were pretty, you know, that says nothing. But if he goes a little bit, oh, I thought your hair looked amazing or that dress, or he, if he talks a little bit about a few details about you, that already makes him way more interesting as, you know, maybe to invest in as a partner. And in your opinion, when should you sleep with a guy? Now, you talked about restraint, yeah. so I'm curious to know your opinion about that. Do, yeah, do you restrain yourself in that regard day. as well? I bet you do. <laughs> Restrict again. Yeah, you know why? First of all, many women sleep with a guy because they feel that then he will like me. But that's exactly the wrong way of thinking. Then he will probably leave because he got what he wanted. Because a guy meets you, right? He's attracted to you. All he knows is that he wants to sleep with you. He doesn't know yet if he sees you as a girlfriend, a potential future wife, or whatever. Men don't go around with all these, you know, lists of, oh, I want to see if she can be it. You know, just fall, they fall into situations. We women are the ones who are like, oh, could he be a future husband? We, you know, need to know. We have this anxiety. Like if he doesn't text, then he's not the one. We should chill more and we should respect ourselves more. And obviously you can sleep with anybody immediately on the first day. You can do whatever you want. But if you want to look for a serious relationship, it's absolutely not the smartest thing to do. You have to mm. wait. You have to um, make sure that this guy is really interested in you. And that takes some time, you know. So for a man actually to become interested in a woman to become interested in the sense that he sees her as a long-term girlfriend, as a serious relationship, he needs to do things for her because that makes him bonded. He needs to spend time with her because that's what bonds him. It's actually us women who once we sleep with him, we're all like, oh my God, this guy is amazing. You know, you date somebody and don't even like him that much, but once you sleep with him, so suddenly he becomes this, Oh, you know, you melt. Actually, he's really good. You know, he did this, he did that. So it's us women who, if we want to protect ourselves and go at it the right way as an investment long term, we should stall with sleeping with him. Definitely for two months. If you can for do it. For two months. Yes. In my <laughs> if world. If you can do it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, I agree. All right. The longer you can hold off, the the better. I mean, I also come at it from a very traditional point of view. And 
I don't know, the couples that I've talked to, I'm not saying that it doesn't work. I've, I've known couples that it worked as well, that they kind of had a much faster start on things, so to speak, if we can call it that. But most long-term relationships and most men that I talk to, they all say that, you know, I wouldn't have maybe fallen in love with her as much or as, or maybe as quickly if she would have slept with me right away. And I'm thinking that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely so, right. Because he needs, a man needs boundaries. It's good for him. He might not like it. He might like want to push her to sleep with him and everything because he has his hormones, right? But that's just his hormones talking. That's not really, it's not clicked yet. You know, men, they meet women and they fall in love because of a woman's beauty, because men are very visual. So they see you like, oh my God, he's in love with you. But is that real? No, 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 that's not real yet. He doesn't really know what he feels. So that's why you need to let some time pass to see if he really is into you. You know, and the ones who are not, they will fall away. That's good. And the ones who are, they will stick to it. So two months is Esther's timeline. Absolutely. And this, of course, this is a very general thing because it also depends on how often you see him in those two months, right? And uh, how much time you spend together and the activities you do together. Because if in those two months you just go on a date once a week for a dinner, that is not good enough, you know? If you want to really see what this guy is about, there's the, it has to be more of a variety thing. You know, once you go to a movie, you find out what kind of movie he likes. Once you go to a park for a walk or you go and do his hobby with him together, you see what he's about. You meet his friends. I don't know. All kinds of things should be thrown into that package before you should take the next step. So I don't want women who listen to this now like, okay, I'm counting two months. It's now Monday, you know, <laughs> November. And, uh, you know, by the time it's Christmas, I just, no, 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 no. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, it all also depends on the intensity and on the frequency and on what you actually share with that person in those two months. Yeah. You mentioned in one of your videos that I had seen that men fall in love faster than women. Yeah. Is that true? How, and yes, how is and that the, true? And that has to do because men fall in love with what they see and women mm -hmm. fall in love with what they hear. So we can be out and meet a guy. For example, you're sitting somewhere in a bar and this guy comes up to you like, oh, my God, you're so gorgeous. I want to, you know, I want to offer you a drink and everything. And he's all over you. And initially you kind of like him and you're flattered, obviously, and he's good looking or whatever. And he will immediately go home after that evening, having spent with you, like, oh, my God, this is her. This is it. This is my future wife, whatever, you know. And you'll be like, yeah, great guy. Okay, yeah, I'd like to see him again. And then when you have a, a real date with him and he starts to talk about himself and he tells you things that you like to hear, then you will fall for him. But he's already fallen for you just because of your beauty. It doesn't matter what you say. He doesn't even listen to what you say. He just looks at you. He stares into your beautiful eyes. He looks at your shiny hair and he's like, oh my God, this is her. And that's why men fall faster in love for women because they fall in love in a way more superficial way. We need to connect. We need emotionally to have some kind of a connection with this guy. Otherwise we can't fall for him. We can look at a movie. We see Brad Pitt or whoever. Okay, he's gorgeous. He's great. But we're not going to put a poster on the wall with Brad Pitt and be like all in love with him. But a man will do that. He will put a poster of like Angelina Jolie, let's say on the wall and be like completely in love with her just because of her visual. He doesn't care what she will say or what her character is. That comes later. So he actually doesn't even know if he's really in love. That's even more important why women should restrict. Very interesting. <laughs> Let's talk about the pursuing thing. So, you know, I, I talk about it a lot in my content. You know, I've mentioned before that on numerous occasions that, you know, before men would fight duels for women and now they don't even pay, you know, for the bill when they go to a restaurant on the first date. And I get a lot of hate for it, ironically enough, really? from men and mainly from what? men in the West. Yes. <sighs> what like, do they a tell lot. you? 
Oh, just, you know, gold digger that, you know, all women care about is money. And I, the amount of times that I've talked about and the amount of times that I've explained why it's important for a man to cover a bill, you know, in the first, I, I mean, I think for the rest of the life together that you have, but especially in the f initial stages of dating and the amount of times I've, I've mentioned my view on it and the amount of hate that I've gotten back is remarkable. And then again, I come to this part of the world, so I come to Eastern Europe and people are like, well, duh, obviously, like that's the least you can do as a man. When you go on a date, you pay for the woman, you know, you bring flowers. It's, that's, it's out of the question for a man not to pay for a date, right? So that's, you know, that's one subject. But the whole, uh, assuming that, you know, a man is pursuing a woman and doing all the, you know, classical things, so to speak, or in my view, things that just make sense, paying for the, for the date, uh, bringing her flowers, doing all these things to pursue her. And then let's say they get into a serious relationship and that stops. How do you, as a woman, without nagging him, without coming at him and being like, you used to buy me flowers and now you don't buy me flowers anymore. You used to do all these things and now you don't do them. How do you encourage him to continue to do those things all throughout your life and all throughout your relationship? Yes. So, yes, it very often stops because when once men are serious in a relationship, they just relax. You know, they are comfortable with you. They don't need feel this need anymore to prove themselves all the time. But then there's also we as women, what is really important? Is it really the flowers or is it more important that, uh, for example, he's there for you when you're ill, you know, when you're sick, he's taking care of you. You have to choose your battles with men. I mean, you know, we women get stuck very often. Yeah. Why don't you put your glass in the dishwasher? Why do you put it in the sink? For me, that's like, really, really, you know, uh, are yeah. you serious? Um, a man is also like the little you. things that just kill a relationship. Yes. And it's so not important, you know, at the end of the day. And it actually all these confrontations about nothing is what actually stops men to want to buy these flowers or to want to do these things for you. So what you should do is two things. First of all, as a woman, you should, again, respect yourself, invest in yourself, because for him to want to, let's say, keep on pursuing you and investing in you, he has to see that you're an asset in his life because you add value to his life, right? So we both do this wrong. We women, when we are serious, it's this very often what I see in also in the Western world, not just in Eastern Europe, uh, that for us, the, it's the goal to get married, right? So we have this dream about our wedding dress and how we want our wedding to be. And it's like an end station for us. But a marriage, a wedding is actually the beginning of a life together. It's actually then that you should start investing in this relationship. So what we women very often don't understand because nobody teaches us this is that your relationship is a job for the rest of your life. And I get a lot of hate from women about that because they're like, oh my God, I can't do all these things. I don't want to do all these things. Well, that's how it is. You know, so how are men? First of all, they need to be encouraged if they want to do things for you. So if you keep nagging about the things he doesn't do for you, he's never going to do those things that he used to do because he feels uninspired. He feels unappreciated. He feels that you don't like him that you don't respect him he just feels that he does everything wrong so you have to instead of nagging about the things he doesn't do encourage him and appre show appreciation and compliment him on the things that he does do even if it's something small women are very resistant to this they're like should i really thank him if he brings me a cup of coffee in bed yes you should thank him should i thank him when he takes me out on a date night we've been together for 10 years Yes, you should thank him. And not just that, write him a sweet note. Do something extra. Show your appreciation, like in a very warm way. Not just say thank you. You can say thank you to anybody, right? So once you as a woman teach yourself how to inspire him, understand the concept of the fact that a man needs to feel appreciated, appreciated to be inspired, then your whole relationship will change. Plus, always invest in yourself. Always evolve as a person. Never stand still. You've done your studies, you're working, you have a child, you're busy. 
do a course in something, learn a new language, change your hair, uh, change your makeup routine, go to the gym. You know, you should treat yourself like you are really worth to be treated in, a, in the best way because then he will be inspired to also treat you. So for example, he doesn't buy you flowers. Why are you waiting for two years for him to buy your flowers? And at Christmas or on your birthday or whenever you're like, why don't you buy me flowers? You never buy me flowers. What is it with the flower? You know, that's not inspiring. You're going to buy yourself flowers and put them on the table and tell him, oh, look how beautiful these flowers are. Look, the whole house, it looks different. Say something nice about it. That's how men get inspired. Yeah. What I'm gathering from you is women need to relax more yes. and take <laughs> less control and just be focused on themselves to make themselves better and then yes. be an inspiration to a man because we get so hung up on these little things and the nagging and, you know, you mentioned getting comfortable. I think so many couples just get comfortable with one another. And I've said this before on my podcast, relationships are supposed to be work. Like you can't, how can you expect to get into a relationship and then for it to just on its own happen the way you prefer for it to happen? Nothing works like that in life, you know? True. You get a job somewhere and people are like, well, a relationship is not supposed to be a job. No, but still, you know, if you don't develop your relationship with your mother, it's not going to go well. Like you have to put in some work to make sure that it works the way yeah. you would Every want it to work. Every relationship is work. When you have a child, it's work. What are you going to do? The child is going to mm -hmm. raise itself going to start walking by yeah. itself no and i mean you know you your friends you invest in your friends don't you invest in your girlfriends don't you go out to catch up and sit and have a girl's night don't you go yeah. i don't know to a spa together to a beach together don't you share a hobby with your friends you know and this is how you should treat your relationship with the most important person in the world the person you choose to share your life with determines the quality of your life but the quality of your life is determined by how you treat, how you manage your life. Yeah. How do you know um, if a relationship is heading for a divorce or if a marriage is heading for a divorce, a relationship is heading towards a breakup? What are some signs? Yes, this is, you know, very often couples get stuck. They just don't seem to get unstuck. They know they've made mistakes, but they just, you know, they're fed up. First of all, it's again about decision. You know, you have to know until how far you want to go with, you know, trying things in a relationship. If you've come to a point that you see that you've tried everything according to your opinion, and he's just still like that, he doesn't get it, then you probably have to, you know, break up, get a divorce because Again, you cannot change a man. You can only try to inspire him by doing better yourself. And if he doesn't get it and years have passed, he keeps on, I don't know, cheating on you or mistreating you or whatever. Um, the best way would be to divorce, which is, of course, a terrible kind of advice. But there are situations that you just can't do anything about it. But I think it's a very individualistic thing. I think for every person, it's very different because when you have kids, it's way more difficult to decide to divorce, even if maybe he has not been a good partner to you because maybe he's a good father to the kids. So it's a very complicated subject, divorce. And there is no, this is when you should divorce. This is when you know. I think for everybody, it's a very individual thing. But once you see that you are so unhappy, that you don't like yourself anymore. This is what I always tell my clients, you know, if you start to not liking yourself anymore when you are with that person, that is like your bell, that is your moment, you know, then you know you have to get out because you have to always in this life like yourself. If you don't like yourself, you cannot have others like you. So if you feel so grossed out that, that I'm still with this partner, I don't like the way I am with him, that is when you have to get out. I, that's actually, I think, very good advice. And I never even thought of it that way. Um, you know, when you look at unhappy couples, very often you see, especially in a woman, that she doesn't like 
the way she is anymore. She doesn't like the way she looks. Like you often hear like, oh, I let myself go. I don't even care about myself anymore. I'm so unhappy kind of thing. So because I think that's, feel unloved. that's great advice. That's why. Hmm. Because that right, woman right. feels unloved. Yeah. Because we women, we and then, need love a lot. We need love a lot. Way more than yeah. men do. Men don't need love a lot that much. They need very different things from us. We need love in like buckets, you know, smother it on, <laughs> bring it on. Right? There's never enough love for us. No. Okay, so women need love. Women also, f f what I gathered from the beginning also of our conversation, uh, we could go on and on. This is so interesting. Yes. <laughs> but discipline is the other thing that is very important that I think a lot of women forget. So you were talking about time management and making sure that, you know, you take charge of what's important in your life, priorities, making sure that you have time for yourself. So discipline is what I'm gathering from you as well. Relax. You just need to relax and let things kind of stop being so controlling, especially towards your man. And uh, you need love from, from, from a man. Whereas a man yeah. needs what? Inspiration, encouragement. I'll tell you what a man needs. Yeah, the most important thing a man needs is two things. He needs to feel free. So that doesn't mean that he is free, but he needs to feel free. He should never feel that you hold him like this with your mothering or, you know, that he completely has to like adapt to, you know, all you, what you want. If he feels that he's free, he will do a lot for you. Because when he feels that it's his choice to do all these things for you, then he feels he's free, right? And the second thing he needs more than anything, I think that's really on top of a man's list, is to feel respect. Uh, I think that that is the most like devastating thing. If you don't show respect to your man, he, he can't deliver. He, he might not even be able to deliver in the bedroom. That's how important it is for a man. He needs to feel that you respect him, which means that he needs to feel that you support him no matter what, that you trust him, that you um, blindly will be there for him. He needs to feel at peace with you. You know, all that respecting your man is that, what I just described. He needs to feel that he can be at peace with you, that you will never betray him, that you will never like, um, cheat on him, that is respect, you know? If a woman cheats on a man, he feels disrespected, you know? So respect is very, very, very important. It's way more important than love. He doesn't need all this lovey-dovey stuff. That's what we need. He needs to respect and to feel free. And this is what most women also don't get, you know? We don't understand that, that he needs to feel free. So very often we try to mold him again, you know, let go, relax, you know, show a man what you want through your actions, not by telling him all the time what you want. When you tell a man all the time what you want, he doesn't feel free. When you show him what you want, then he feels that he's in charge of doing that for you. And that makes him feel masculine. That makes him feel good about himself. And that makes him feel respected. It's kind of a, well, you know, it always, it, every question that I've asked you, I'm like, oh, it kind of seems like a hard thing. And you're like, no, it's not. It's actually very simple. So when you say all these things, like this is, this makes perfect sense. It's so simple. Why are so many people struggling with it? Is it because they don't know? Because we resist. Because we're super selfish nowadays. You know, we live in a world that it's all about me, 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 me. You know, it's, it's our society that has made us like that. You know, we grow up with everything is about me. We all, we're all individuals. We don't want to accept each other for who we are, you know, because at the end of the day, when you look at recent history, like let's not go too far back, but let's say the last 50 years, okay? The ones who have changed like day and night, you know, the differences between day and night, that's how big the change is, is women. You know, 50 years ago, women weren't working, not all women anyway. Women in many countries weren't even voting. Women didn't have any sexual freedom, you know. Women were staying at home. We were submissive to our men. So it's us who have changed, and therefore our expectations have changed. 
And that works against us. So we resist all this, what I just described, which is actually very simple, uh, how to be like this and then you get that. And, you know, you can write it down, basically make a handbook out of it, which I'm actually writing at the moment. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but we resist, you know, because we feel that we've struggled so much to achieve all this freedom now, but all this freedom that we have uh, has made us crippled, you know? We've done this to ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, I always say in my videos, um, in a comedic way, of course, that I don't blame the men, you know, in the West for lacking that initiative. Like the the one of the last videos that I posted was whenever I come to Eastern Europe, I never have to lift anything heavy ever. Like if there's a guy standing yes, next to me and he so sees true. me trying to lift something, it's I so never true. have to do it without any romantic connotation. If there's a guy standing next to me, he will come up and he will just do it for me without even asking me if I need help. That's Whereas the most whenever romantic I land... thing. Yeah, it's so romantic. <laughs> for me, that's romantic because I grew up in the yeah. Netherlands, you know, there. Yeah. Oh my God. It's, it's bad. I don't want to go into that because I will say bad things about Dutch men and women. Uh, yes, there it's like, uh, I never talk when I'm in the Netherlands. I just, you know, go with the flow. In Greece, yeah, yeah. men will lift your shopping bags. I love it. They will take yeah. your suitcase yeah. out of your hands. It's, it's so beautiful. But that's also the yeah. other thing. You know, we, that's again our fault. So sorry to say that. Keep blaming us, but, you know, what can we do? We, we, we got to take almost... some personal responsibility. Yeah. We got to take some responsibility oh, for what yeah. we've done. <laughs> you know, yeah, we've done this to ourselves, you know. So yeah. the thing is, for example, we don't even accept compliments. You know, it's like, oh, no, no, I can do it. What is that? No, stop. Say, oh, thank you. Yeah. Do it for me. So wonderful. That's hard yeah. for us. That makes us feel softies, you know. But it's actually when you can show a certain kind of vulnerability as a woman, this is also part of this feminine energy, then you actually show strength because it's way harder to show your vulnerability because we've all learned to like, no, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. It's okay. You know? Yeah. Why do all that? Why? You, you set yourself yeah. up for a like, oh my God, I'm doing so much and I can't do this anymore. Yeah, for sure. I've said this like a million times on my social media and on my podcast, but I came up with this quote, chivalry isn't patriarchy and femininity isn't weakness. And I don't know so why true. we've gotten that so confused that everything that is related to chivalrous actions that men do, we right away consider like, oh my God, he's, he's undermining my power. He, I can do it all myself. And then if a woman isn't her feminine, we often regard her as weak. That's not at all the case, and it shouldn't no, be. No, you're so right. We, we, you're we've so gotten right. confused. Yeah. You're so right. Yeah, because it's it's the women who got it confused, us, because we made all these rapid changes. Men haven't changed that much when you think of it. But now right. men are kind of trying to adjust to all those changes, but they don't know anymore what to be. They don't know anymore how to be the guy no. because we've, like, you know, cut it off. Yeah. Yeah. I don't blame the men. I feel them because I wouldn't know what to do either. You know, I don't want to step on your, you know, idea of power. I don't want to undermine your power. I'm, I'm going to do, I'm kind of going to follow the trend and do whatever is accepted by, by women in the culture. Yeah. So true. Well, Esther, thank you so much. This was an absolute thank pleasure. Thank you for having me. I will thank link you for all me. of the, oh, thank you for coming on. I will link all of the, well, your Instagram and all of that, your socials, but just in case, you know, somebody's listening and they're not going to go into the caption, how can people find you online? They better go into the caption. <laughs> they can find me on TikTok, which I love TikTok. They can find me on Instagram, on YouTube, on Facebook. Uh, I'm everywhere with my name. So once you have the links up, they can just click on it and find me. And uh, yeah, I started TikTok a year ago, so most of my videos are there. And recently, I've also been very busy with Instagram because I like that too. Yeah. You blew up on both, which again tells you A, how good your advice is, and B, how big of a pain point all of this is for so many people. That, that's yeah, what it tells I, me at least, you know? I'm, for me, it's a good thing because it gives me a lot of work <laughs> because all this confusion. But 
I really, you know, without let's say the work part, I really uh, am so grateful that I can help a lot of people. When I get messages from women who tell me, since I've been listening to you, I met this man and it's going so well. That's for me like the best news ever, because I really think that um, we can do much better. We can do much better,、mm-hmm. all of us. So that's where I'm trying、yeah. to help. Yeah. Thank you for doing that, and thank you for coming on. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I will see you next week.